Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Oh, uh oh. This doesn't sound very good. <laughs> See what we got today. Um, okay. Let me first say this is the people's house. It should be a place all can see. Uh, we are saddened by the tragic loss of life after the lightning strike in Lafayette Park last night. Our hearts are with the families who lost lives, who, who lost loved ones, and we are praying for those still fighting for their lives. The National Park Service and local law enforcement have been providing updates, and I would direct you to them for any uh, additional information. As you may have seen, on Monday, the President and the First Lady will travel to Eastern Kentucky with Governor Andy Bashir and his wife, Brittany, to visit communities devastated by flooding in recent days. They will also survey recovery efforts to, at one of the region's FEMA disaster recovery centers. We have been closely monitoring the floods since they began, and our hearts break for the families of those who have lost their love, lives or are missing. And for all of those who have been impacted, the president quickly directed his team to surge federal support to the region and authorize additional disaster assistance for Eastern Kentucky last weekend. Since then, FEMA has provided more than $3.1 million to support impacted individuals and families in their recovery efforts. More than 400 state and federal search and rescue and water rescue personnel, as well as members of National Guard, are on the ground supporting search and rescue efforts. And earlier this week, Secretary Becerra also declared a public health emergency for the Commonwealth of Kentucky, which gives the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services beneficiaries and their health care providers and suppliers greater flexibility in meeting emergency health needs. And finally, the Board Coalition of Support, the Broad, pardon me, Coalition of Support for the Inflation Reduction Act continues. Today, over 40 major companies, including Levi Strauss, Logitech, Shell, Lyft, Unilever, and more, sent a letter urging Congress to pass the Inflation Reduction Act because it will combat inflation, lower prices for Americans, invest in manufacturing, and transition our country to a clean energy economy. And a bipartisan group of former EPA administrators called this package the most significant piece of climate legislation in United States history. And finally, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which represent communities across the country, said they are counting on Congress to get this bill done without delay because it will take critical steps to, to lash to slash carbon emissions, provide affordable health care, and so much more. And with that, Josh, it's game day. It's it game is, day for you. Uh, Welcome to the Super Bowl. Yeah, so, so let's, let's, let's start by going there. Uh, first of two subjects. The jobs report today came in stronger than expected. But some economists and some of the financial markets say that there's fears that means inflation could stay elevated. What does the White House think this report tells us about inflation? So today, as you saw from the president's statement, the unemployment rate matches the lowest it's been in over 50 years. That's 3.5 percent. Uh, more people are working that, than at any point in American history. And we have gained back all of the jobs, all of the jobs that were lost during the pandemic. And so we quickly, what the president did was quickly repair the labor market uh, that was dam that was caused because of COVID. The labor market was damaged, as you all know, that supply, the supply chain, there wasn't a COVID response, a uh, comprehensive COVID response. And so that was the president's primary goal and, and the goal of the, re the American Rescue Plan. And let's not forget, that passed in April of his first year. Only, only Democrats uh, voted for this bill. And because of that, because of the American Rescue Plan, uh, we saw, we are seeing, or we are coming, uh, coming off of a very strong economy and so that is important that labor market uh, is important and so uh, and so we can see how the American Rescue Plan was effective what the jobs that we have gained back and uh, just a couple of example US manufacturing is back with the fastest recovery since the early 1950s and the passage of the chips bill uh, 
that will only strengthen our manufacturing, manufacturing more. And we are seeing that the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act is already increasing the amount of infrastructure job. That is all good news. And so that is how we see uh, this current jobs uh, report. And uh, we're going to just continue to do the work. Uh, inflation clearly is something that people truly feel uh, at home around their kitchen table. And the president has a plan uh, to uh, to uh, address that, uh, including what he's what we've been able to see with gas prices coming down uh, more uh, a decline that we haven't seen like this in over a decade. And so all of these things are important. And also, we're going to do everything that we can to uh, uh, to encourage and uh, uh, continue to talk to legislators to pass the Inflation Reduction Act. So just to clarify, though, you don't think this report tells us much about the path of inflation going forward, or do you think it does? What we think is that this is good news, what we saw, right? That means uh, when we gain back all the jobs that were lost during the pandemic, that's a good thing. That's a good thing to have more jobs out there regain that. That's, a, as you know, someone who co covers the economy. And we're at 3.5 percent. Uh, so all of those things are, are really important. When it comes to inflation, again, the president has a plan. He's going to continue uh, to uh, do his part on, on reducing costs for families. Uh, and uh, we're going to let the Federal Reserve do their job, be independent. They have the monetary uh, kind of tools uh, to deal with inflation, and we leave that work to them. Okay. And then, secondly, given China's actions on climate and the military dialogue with the U.S., does the White House think Speaker Pelosi bears any blame for the rupture? And do you worry that the relationship with China could devolve further? So, I'll, we'll, and you've heard us say this uh, before, um, the, the Speaker had every right, every right, uh, it is her right to have uh, gone to Taiwan. Uh, members of Congress, Congress make those decisions. Uh, we do not tell them what they can or cannot do or where they can travel. Uh, we have said this many times before. We provide a full, thorough uh, briefing uh, when they do travel. And, uh, and so, again, there was no reason uh, to have this uh, escalation that we're seeing from China. Uh, you know, it is, uh, it is uh, fundamentally irresponsible uh, what they are doing. And uh, we'll continue our efforts to keep open lines of communication with Beijing while defending our interests and values in the region. Uh, this is what the world expects, the United States and China, and we encourage Beijing to keep this commitment as well when it comes to the dialogue, the climate dialogue uh, that, uh, uh, that was canceled. Um, uh, and the, the, the military and climate dialogue that was canceled. So this is, uh, again, she had every right. There's precedent for it. We talked about 25 years ago when uh, Speaker Gingrich went to uh, Taiwan. And so uh, we're good. We, are, we are not going to, you know, give, a, give any, uh, any more than that on the Speaker's travel. Okay, you just say you're not going to give any more on the Speaker Shuttle, but I'm going to ask a similar question. Sure. Because anyway, I, I think that you guys have said repeatedly that it was her right to go, her decision to go, but now, like my colleague just said, now you've seen the results, now you've seen what has happened. Do you feel that these escalated tensions in the region were worth any message that Pelosi's visit sent? I mean, I'm going to say what I just said. Uh, the, the Speaker had the right to go to Taiwan. Uh, she is the Speaker of the House. She should speak uh, to the impact of her travel on her own. That is for her to answer. And uh, our focus is on defending our interests, as we have said many times, and the values in the Indo-Pacific. And that's what we're going to focus on. Back on jobs, I know you guys are excited about the jobs report, but um, for most people, wages are just, wages for those jobs are just not keeping up with inflation. So fundamentally, is the anxiety we're hearing from Americans about the economy really an issue of wages and benefits? And what is the administration still doing to work on that? Look, we, we understand what uh, Americans are feeling. The president understands that. Um, very personally. This is why he has done the work that he's done uh, this past 18 months uh, to get the economy going again. And now with the with uh, with inflation as well, with cost uh, going up for Americans, he's focused on that. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is something that we continue to watch very closely. Uh, and we're going to continue to do the work uh, to make sure that Americans feel relief. Uh, and so that, that work doesn't stop. And there, we know that there's more work to do. But as it relates to the jobs report and where we are and how the economy is moving forward, the strong labor market, 
uh, does matter. The strong labor market does say a lot about the economy. Uh, and then we're going to just continue to do the work that we need to do, that the Americans are, are waiting, the business of the Americans that, that, that are waiting us to want us to do. Uh, Ms. Green, Russia said today that it was ready to discuss a prisoner swap with regard to Brittany Griner, Griner in private. And President Biden just told us that he was hopeful and working on it. Can you give us a sense of where things stand and have those private discussions begun? So we said this, and uh, Secretary Blinken spoke to, to this earlier today, this morning. We have made a substantial offer uh, to bring Brittany and Paul Whelan home. They need to be home. They should be home. Uh, they are being wrongfully detained. That is something you've heard us say. This morning, Foreign Minister Lavrov said publicly that they are prepared to engage through the channels we have established at the President's direction. Uh, as Secretary Blinken said this morning, as I just mentioned, we will continue to pursue those. Uh, this, this is something the President and national security have had on top of mind. This is a priority for them. Uh, we need to bring them home. We need to bring Brittany home. We need to bring Paul home. And we're going to continue to do the work uh, that we have been doing in this administration. Uh, to make sure that U.S. nationals that are being wrongfully detained, that are being held hostage, uh, come home. And so, as far as the negotiations, we say this all the time. It remains, uh, to, uh, not remains to be seen, but it, but we are, we have to keep the negotiations private, uh, and uh, and we'll continue uh, to do that. And so, uh, but also we will continue to to uh, call on Russia to uh, to take the the substantial offer that we put in front of them seriously. On a separate topic, is, is the White House following the Alex Jones trial? And do you believe that he should have to pay millions of dollars for the misinformation about Sandy Hook? I have to say I'm not following the Alex Jones trial. Uh, I'm going to, since that's still going on, we don't comment on uh, on any uh, uh, trials or litigations or that's, that's, in, that's happening. Um, our hearts go out to the families that lost their loved ones. It was a tragic day. Um, that is... Uh, you know, uh, the president knows that very personally. He's met with the families. Um, and uh, we continue to do everything we can uh, to protect our, our communities from gun violence. Uh, that's why he was proud to sign the bipartisan piece of legislation that came before him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's why we're going to continue to do the work uh, to make sure that we protect kids in school, that we protect uh, people going to the grocery store, that we protect, uh, you know, communities and, and families. Lastly, like Governor Abbott of Texas said today he started sending uh, busloads of migrants to New York uh, in an effort to share responsibility um, with other states. Does the White House have a reaction to that? So, you know, it's the latest stunt from the governor, another stunt of, of busing, de uh, busing uh, desperate migrants across, across the country, uh, and uh, he's using them as a political uh, uh, you know, as a political ploy. I mean, this is what he's been doing, and it's shameful. And I've said this before. I was asked this uh, last week, and it's costing, it's costing the state of Texas 1.5 million dollars. That's what this game that he's doing, that he's playing, is costing Texans 1.5 million dollars. And we have seen him do this before. He so his so-called Operation Lone Star put National Guardsmen and law enforcement in dangerous situations and resulted in a logistical nightmare needing federal rescue. His secondary inspections of trucks crossing into Texas cost a billion dollars a week in trade at one bridge alone without turning without turning up a single case of human uh, and or drug trafficking. So this is again a there is a and I, again, I talked about this last week. There is a legal process that we have going on right now. Uh, and if he cared about it, if he was really, really serious, he would let that process move through. But instead, he wants to play politics and, and, and uh, you know, use, uh, use the lives of migrants who are desperate to be here, uh, who are trying to find a better life for themselves, uh, and use them. And also costing his constituents millions, of, over a million dollars. That's what he's doing. Jeff just mentioned this, but he, uh, the president, uh, was asked about Brittany Griner, and he said, I'm hopeful. What is it that is making him feel hopeful right now? I mean, he's the president. He has to feel hopeful, right? This is something that is important to him. I don't think, he, if, he, if he had said something else, it, wouldn't, it would not have, uh, 
you know, that's, you know, you want to make sure that you're, he's zeroed in, he's focused on what the task is at hand. Uh, his team is working on this, his national security team. You heard from Secretary Blinken, you've heard from us. Uh, this is something, uh, again, he has, to, he has been the top of mind, bringing U.S. nationals home who are being wrongfully uh, detained, who are being held hostage, has been a priority of his. And you have, he, he, you know, th there's no other place but to be hopeful and to do the work uh, that we need to do to get this done. But, but as far as you know, it wasn't a reference to necessarily some specific development or developments that no, I, now maybe. No, I wouldn't read into it. I think, you know, as president, he's doing what presidents do, you know, giving hope. His, you know, their families are watching. Their families are listening to everything that we're saying. It's important to give them hope. Uh, and I'm hoping that they continue to be hopeful. That is important uh, as well as president to make sure that you, you, portray, you, you portray that as well. I just have a monkeypox question. Um, it's pretty well documented at this point that there's a good amount of frustration within the LGBTQ community, people saying that they're having a hard time uh, getting vaccines. I wonder, uh, first, I have two questions, what the president's overall message is for that community, uh, people who are saying they feel kind of let down by the administration and its response to monkeypox. So let me just first say that um, the president is going to do everything that he can to end this outbreak. Uh, he's going to use every, uh, pull every lever uh, to fight monkeypox. And, uh, you know, back in May when he was in Asia, he was asked about monkeypox and he said, uh, you know, we should be vigilant. Uh, and that was back in May when we heard about uh, the first cases. And so his, his administration has been hard at work. Uh, making sure that we have a comprehensive uh, response. Uh, and what has happened, and talked about this a little bit too, is that it has evolved rapidly. So there, we had monkeypox back in 2003, we had it in, in 2021, small cases, uh, but it has rapidly evolved. And this is not uncommon for the dynamic of an infectious disease to change. And that's what we're seeing. And any time uh, we, we saw change happening or we saw that we needed to meet the moment at the time, whatever was happening with the increase uh, of cases, we met the, that moment. Uh, you know, scaling up our vaccines and testing as it became clear that the virus was spreading more rapidly than other monkeypox outbreaks, as I just mentioned. Uh, very aggressive steps that make sense, that, that makes sense to the moment that we're dealing with. And you heard me, you heard us this week uh, with our monkeypox response. 600,000 doses have arrived in jurisdiction, which is going to be incredibly helpful. We have 150,000 doses that were supposed to come in November that is now coming in September. Uh, we've uh, scaled up uh, the capacity of testing to 80,000, which is also very important uh, to make sure that we do that. The public health uh, emergency that HHS did yesterday, that is going to help uh, the CDC come up with data to how we do one to one vaccine to five uh, vaccines. So we are increasing the vaccine supply. Again, this has been rapidly changing uh, over the last couple of months and we're meeting the moment uh, at, at, every, at every turn. So is there a specific message for the LGBTQ oh, community? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Look, um, you know, this is a, this is a time that, that um, yeah, we understand how the community feels. It's very concerning uh, and I want to be really careful because I, it's important that we don't uh, stigmatize any community. And so, um, and so that is also important for us. Look, the president's going to do everything that he can uh, to make sure that we end this outbreak. He is working on this, his team is working on this every day. He's regularly updated. He knows what's happening. He knows how this is being handled. He knows uh, that we are doing everything that we can to increase the, va the vac vaccine supply, which is going to make a difference. And let's not forget, we announced uh, the monkeypox coordinators just this week, Bob, Bob Fenton, who is an expert uh, in mass vaccination site. He's an expert uh, in, f in FEMA leadership. So he knows uh, how to deal with these type of emergencies. And so we're going to continue to to uh, to, to be zero focused on this. So, so if you are a member of uh, an at-risk uh, community and you're unable to get a vaccine right now, which again we're hearing stories of that, is the federal government's recommendation that you pause or at least reduce sexual activity until you can get vaccinated? What I will say is you should talk to your medical provider. I am not a medical provider, but I would say talk to your medical provider. Uh, 
and uh, get, uh, uh, get the information that you need so that you are protecting yourself and you know how to move forward. Uh, that is the first thing that we tell folks with, at any, with anything, right? We did that with COVID uh, and we'll do that with this as well. Uh, but I do want, want the community to know and folks, Americans to know in general that we are laser focused on this uh, and we are going to do everything we can to end this outbreak. It is, a, it is also a, a priority for the president, which is why we have a rapid response team now in the White House as well. Back. Yeah, thanks, Kareem. Is the strong jobs report today uh, enough for the White House to say that there won't be a recession on the horizon? Uh, I'll say this. The strong labor market is what we're looking at, right? That tells us uh, because of the strong labor market and that, that being in one of the many economic indicators uh, shows us that we are not in a recession, uh, that we are in a transition. Um, and that is uh, very important to note. Uh, and uh, look, we have to understand that we are in a different place uh, with the, uh, in this world right now than we have ever been. Uh, we are coming, we're in a pandemic, right? Dealing with a pandemic, it's more manageable now, but there's COVID, uh, there's a war in Ukraine. Uh, all of that, all these factors also play into uh, uh, where we are right now, plays into the inflation. Uh, being up, plays into what we were seeing with gas prices, now we're seeing them come down, plays into what we were seeing with food increases, now we're seeing that come down a bit as well. Uh, and so these are not, this is not a normal economy. Uh, Secretary Yellen did a great job laying that down uh, last week uh, uh, at the Treasury de uh, the Treasury Department and talked about the impacts, the outside impacts and that how that has affected uh, the economy. But right now, but because of the work that this president has done, the American Rescue Plan, the bipartisan uh, infrastructure legislate law now, uh, and also now CHIPS uh, Act. This is going to to make a difference uh, as well. At one point, he said that uh, recession was not inevitable. Uh, is he? Are, you know, is the White House now ready to say a recession won't happen? But I'm going to, uh, I'm, Joey. I'm going to go back to what I just said. We are not. This is a. We're, we're living in a different time, right? When you have a war happening, uh, when you have a. a a uh, once-in-a-generation pandemic. Uh, and that's what the secretary talked about last week when she explained uh, the economy, when she explained where we are uh, currently. And so that also matters. But at the same time, we do have a strong labor market. Uh, and that indicator tells us a lot about, about uh, the trajectory of the economy. It does not show uh, that we're in a recession. And I'm not just me, not just, not, not just folks in the White House are saying this. You're hearing this also from economists. I'm going to go back down. Go ahead. And I'll come up. Thanks. Uh, just to go back to Jeff's first question about the channel between mm -hmm. the Russians and the U.S. What more can you tell us about that channel? Is it at the staff level? Who's engaged in talks? And are those talks on that channel now under uh, there's still, we have kept the lines of communication to open, as I have just said, on, um, on, uh, uh, on just on a bunch of levels, as you, as you know, as we've talked about before with Beijing, we've been uh, communicating with them. The president spoke with President Xi uh, last, uh, last Thursday. That was the fifth time that he spoke with him. We have always said how important it is to have the open line of uh, communication, that open line of dialogue that still is the same. Uh, but again, uh, you know, China's actions right now is fundamentally irresponsible. Uh, there is no need and there's no reason uh, for uh, this escalation. Uh, if, if you're talking about the speaker, this is what we're talking about, the speaker going to Taiwan, uh, which is precedent. There's nothing unusual about that. Uh, we have seen it before. Uh, members of Congress have visited multiple times uh, uh, to Taiwan this year alone. And so, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is something that uh, is not needed. And so we're going to continue uh, to condemn the actions that we have seen. And, uh, you know, and we have said that China may take, uh, we're, we're going to take steps like this, and we expect that they will continue uh, to react both in coming and over the long, longer time horizon. The uh, ambassador, after he was brought here for the march, uh, published an op-ed in the Washington Post, and essentially he concluded that um, the Taiwan issue could lead the U.S. and China to conflict. What's, so, what's your response? So I'll say this, and, and you were asking me this, uh, you know, we're, we're going to keep our, 
uh, regular uh, communications with our PRC counterparts. So that's number one, as we're talking about the DeMarch. Uh, after China's action, we summoned a PRC ambassador uh, to the White House on Thursday to demarch him about the PRC's pro pro provocative actions. We condemned the, the PRC's military actions, which are irresponsible again, at odds with our longstanding goal of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. We made clear to the ambassador that Beijing's actions are of concern to Taiwan, to us and to our partners around the world. We highlighted yesterday's G7 statement re rejecting Beijing's attempt to coerce and intimidate Taiwan and express our support for ASEAN statement overnight about the importance of de-escalating tensions. Finally, we made clear once again, as we have done privately at the highest le level and publicly, nothing has changed about our one China policy. Nothing has changed. We also made clear that the United States is prepared for what Beijing chooses to do. So we will not seek or do not want a crisis. At the same time, we will not deter uh, from operating in the seas and skies of the Western uh, Pacific. So that is our message uh, to, um, uh, to our counterparts. That is our message uh, to Beijing. And that's what we have been communicating. Just one more for me. Uh, in um, Moscow today, a Kremlin spokesman said the U.S. is trying to solve the Britain Griner uh, Paul Whelan situation with, with, with microphone diplomacy and uh, that any deal might be put at risk if you talk about it publicly. Uh, are you concerned that the announcement that the U.S. has made the substantial offer puts the deal in jeopardy or in any way at risk? No, because we've been very clear that we're not going to negotiate in public. Uh, you know, we wanted to be very, um, uh, very upfront about what we were doing. That's why we mentioned the substantial uh, offer. Um, and we expect or we uh, advise Russia to, to take it seriously. And it is important for Brittany to come home. It is important for Paul Whelan to come home. Uh, the president is going to do, uh, is going to work every day very hard uh, with his uh, national security team to make that happen. And also with the other U.S. nationals uh, who, are being, who are being wrongfully detained and held hostage. Uh, we are showing that this is a top of mind and a priority for this administration. Thanks, Green. Why do you think people are continuing to drop out of the labor market? Say that one more time. What do you, well, can you labor, say more? The labor force participation rate is at its lowest level of the year now. Why do you think that is? So participation actually ticked up, um, and uh, for it for declined zero point one percentage points to sixty two point one percent, the lowest level of the year. So it actually ticked up for prime age workers when you look at twenty five to fifty four, and for uh, workers sixty five and plus. The tick down this month was actually about teenagers, uh, and it's important to keep in mind that the labor force participation rate has bounced back uh, relatively quickly compared to its pace in the past. So we have seen an uptick uh, in the labor force. Uh, again, what we saw this month was a tick down uh, with teenagers. Okay, and then on foreign policy, President Biden's approach, foreign policy approach, did not prevent Putin from invading Ukraine. What makes you so sure that his approach here is going to prevent China from invading Taiwan? Uh, Putin is now a pariah on the world stage. And that has happened because what the president did is he brought together uh, the NATO alliance. Uh, they are more, stronger than they've ever been. Uh, we're about to welcome Sweden and Finland, uh, which has expanded the alliance, which is incredibly important. Uh, and if you look at what's going on with Russia's economy, uh, it's, uh, it's not doing too great right now. Uh, and that's because of what we have been able to do as a unit, what we, what we have been able to show our force of strength, the sanctions who have actually had effect uh, on Russia. And so that matters. You have seen a, a leadership from this, this president that would not, if NATO would not have, the strength of NATO uh, and uh, how they've come together would not have happened if it wasn't for this president's leadership. So is President Biden's goal here then to make Xi a pariah on the world stage? No, I'm just speaking to Russia. What I'm saying about uh, China is that there's no reason for Beijing to have escalated the way that they have. There is no reason. The, the policy has not changed. We are still uh, in line with the one China policy. The speaker had every right to take that trip. And so 
that is uh, that is something that they need to speak to. Okay, and then last one. Why is the president bragging today about gas prices? Because it's gone down. It's still a dollar and seventy-two cents higher than when he took office. It has come. It has come down in a way that we haven't seen. Its trajectory coming down in over a decade. Still and over it is, four dollars a gallon. Okay. Though is that good? You want to talk to a nurse or a teacher? or a firefighter if, if having that little bit of breathing room doesn't matter to them. Are nurses and teachers and firefighters saying gas prices are only $4.11, I'm saying this that, is great? I'm saying that, that, that even that little bit of breathing room matters to families, especially during this summer when people are traveling, when people are trying to do what they can for their families, when people are trying to think about what are we going to do with our kids, drive them to camp, driving to see other family members across the country. This matters. When you think about 85 cents uh, per month for a family member, you think that doesn't matter for everyday Americans? That matters. And the reason we're seeing that is because of the work that this president has done the last several months. It's because of what the historic tapping of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, uh, one million uh, gallons per day until September. That matters uh, because of all the work that he continues to do when it comes to inflation. So he's going to continue. There's more work to be done. He's going to continue to do that work. But I, I, to say that um, that uh, the, the changes, the drop that we have seen. Uh, in, in uh, the, at the pump per gallon doesn't matter. I think that is wrong. I think that is not true. And I think that does give a little, a little bit of space and breathing room for families and is important. I'll come to the back in a second. Thank you. you have announced uh, the travel for Monday to Kentucky, but you did not indicate uh, whether that is contingent on the president's COVID status. And you said the pool would be covering that as well. We've had two instances now where the pool has uh, not been able to fully cover the president with the remarks uh, the other evening and today. And so a little kind of uh, of our press business here. Um, that's a concern to our uh, collective uh, organizations here that we don't have the full pool able to cover the president uh, as we would like. We certainly understand that he has COVID and that that is a concern, but our organizations have been covering in person for the whole two plus years of COVID. And so will he be going to Kentucky regardless of his COVID status? And will a full pool accompany him? Can I, as you know, when it comes to the White House protocol, we go above and beyond. The fact that the president is testing every day uh, is not, that's not what everyday Americans do. Because he's in a unique situation, uh, our testing protocol is, uh, is, is, you know, is, more than what it should be, right? Norm, more than what every everyday Americans do. So we, he's been testing every day since he since he came off uh, Paxlovid, and the reason why you know that he's positive is because we've been testing him and we've been transparent about that. Look, this, Kayla, this is a unique situation with unique circumstances. Well, but is your point about that that he, I mean, he's testing every. We know yep. he's the president. Yep. Many of us test every day as well in order to be here. Uh, he is positive. What is the point of that? I mean, it, oh, because you were asking me. Um, I mean, our I'll answer. Is, will he travel, and will the pool go with him? And we would like to have the full pool represented if the president's going to do events right. here on the. Well, White I House. was explaining what has been happening the last couple of days. Right, it is a unique situation with unique circumstances. Unique. Our job is to keep you all safe. It really is. That's what we want to make sure. You've seen. You saw the doctor's letter. The president is still testing positive. So we need to make sure that we are not uh, being irresponsible, right? That we are making sure that you guys are being kept safe. Uh, but everyone was 15 feet away from him today, if you're speaking about that, outside and masked. And so that is also important. Now, as it, as it relates to his travel on Monday, he will only travel if he tests negative. But I also wanted to address, what I was addressing is the last couple of week it sounds like there's been you know some well, questions about that. that we have used is to have a virtual event where the full pool would be able to participate and be able to uh, cover the president ask questions he's taken questions I think mm -hmm. from Peter and others mm -hmm. and he uh, took a question today from right. someone yeah but it's only a limited pool so yeah. we are just again on behalf of all of my colleagues asking completely for completely understand and I would I would also say from here is that we have been transparent with all of you about uh, the when it comes to COVID and giving a letter every day we our job 
again, the president is in a unique position. We are all in unique uh, positions, and we have to make sure that we adhere to protocols that are given to us and make sure that he's safe and you all are safe as well. Uh, but to your first question, I was kind of addressing uh, just this past week, but to your first question, he will not travel unless he is negative. Of course, he will not. He would, we would not do that. Thanks so much, Craig. I, I was hoping, you, could you address uh, a new CBO analysis uh, about the Inflation Reduction Act that says it would have um, almost no impact or a negligible impact on inflation in 2022 and 2023? So I'll say this, you know, leading economists have said that this uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, that's been analyzed by them, that's been looked at uh, by these economists, will indeed reduce inflation. And we've heard from 126 uh, leading economists, including seven Nobel Prize winners. They say it, it will put downward pressure on inflation. Five uh, former Treasury secretaries yesterday from bipartisan administrations say it will fight inflation. That's former, for, we're talking about former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, former CEA Chair Jason Furman, uh, Maya McGinnis, President Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, all have said that it will fight inflation. But is, I mean, is, 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 is it a dismissing of the CBO, though? Um, and is it fair? I mean, is it is it appropriate to, to brand it as the Inflation Reduction Act when it will have such a little effect in the next two years? when people are feeling it right now. Well, if you think of, if you think about the the reduction act, uh, legislate the inflation reduction act, it will have an effect also on drug costs, right? Lowering uh, prices for uh, pharmaceutical costs, which is going to make a difference uh, in a big way to seniors, to families. Uh, when you think about Medicare being able to negotiate with something that we have been wanting to do for decades and have not been able to do that, when you think about energy costs, utility bills coming down, when you think about the $300 billion that's going to go to the deficit uh, that we've already, the, 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 uh, uh, the deficit uh, coming down that we already saw in $1.7 trillion last year, that is going to make a difference. That is going to flight uh, inflation. And so, it should be called the Inflation Reduction Act because that's exactly what it's, it's going to do. It is an anti-inflation bill uh, that the pr president is grateful for, and it's historic in all of the ways that I just laid out. And let's not forget, uh, you know, you have a uh, majority of Americans who support the different components of this bill. Uh, and so that is important. This is something that the president has been working on uh, for a long time, and also making sure uh, that corporations uh, pay their fair share, and that is also important. And not increasing taxes uh, on Americans who are making under 400000 All you. of that happens. On, on another topic on Afghanistan, um, can you just talk about how uh, the White House will be marking the anniversary of the withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan? So what type of plans to honor the 13 service so members? One of the things that I can say is that, um, you know, this time last year, the president had to make a, a tough choice, uh, which is ending a civil war, a 20-year civil war uh, in Afghanistan, as you all know, that put our troops, number one, put our troops at risk and also cost, uh, cost us $2 trillion. And he made a promise, uh, $2 trillion was spent, and he made a promise uh, that he would not, he, he made the decision to uh, bring home our troops, uh, get them out of harm's way, uh, and make sure that, uh, uh, you know, make sure that uh, we're able uh, to have that over the horizon counterterrorism that we, sh we saw uh, this past uh, weekend, that we could still uh, uh, make sure that it's not, it's, uh, it's not a safe haven for terrorists in Afghanistan and still do the job that we need to do in keeping uh, the Americans safe and, that, and keeping our Americans' interests. And that's what the President showed uh, this past week in a very clear way. Um, so when it comes to uh, when it comes to the anniversary, we will. Uh, uh, ha it's an, an appropriate opportunity uh, to honor the service and sacrifice of those uh, we lost, and as as well as recognize the many people we saved. Uh, we had a lot of. Uh, uh, we've lost so many lives. More than 2,000 uh, military members have lost their lives in Afghanistan. But we also want to uh, be thankful to the folks who uh, who did everything that they can to save uh, save uh, save.
save lives as well last year. We are focused on how we are on a stronger strategic footing now that the war is over. Uh, we are continuing to help people leave Afghanistan and resettle in the United States through Operation Allies Welcome. We will continue to ensure we remain vigilant and appropriately positioned to counter any terrorism threat as you saw uh, the President do this past Saturday. I'm so sorry. I'll come to the back. Um, just, just follow up on some of the questions. You guys have made it clear that the speaker had the right to travel to Taiwan, and that was her prerogative. But there's a difference between her ability to do that and whether the White House agrees with that decision. They're two totally different things. And I understand the reason the president did not explicitly say to her, do not go, is because he respects that line uh, and that independence of, of that governing body um, and her leadership. At the same time, we have seen an escalation of, te of tensions between the U.S. and China directly as a result of Speaker Pelosi's visit. So I'm wondering why the White House is hesitant to publicly criticize the decision to travel, given that privately White House officials raised concerns before she traveled and continue to raise concerns about that decision. Because it's her right to travel. And there's a precedent for this. But whether or not it was her right, which you've established, the result of that right has created problems for the White House and the administration. Again, my answer is not going to change. It was her right to travel. Uh, there's precedent for this. Nothing has changed in the sense of our One China policy that's guided by the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979. Nothing has changed in our perspective. And so, uh, again, it is the right for the speaker to travel wherever she pleases, wherever she chooses. She is the speaker. She's a member of Congress. Our job is to give her the information that she needs to make that decision on her own. Uh, again, anything more about how she feels about the travel, uh, her thoughts, I would refer you to the speaker. And then just one more on the economy. Was the White House, was President Biden, the top economic officials here, at all surprised pleasantly um, <coughs> likely that uh, about the number to obviously it beat expectations by quite a bit. What was the reaction inside the White House? Is, is there any sort of background or color you can give us about how the news was received? So I, I do want to talk about the market expectations. I know I talked about it here when Josh asked me yesterday. So uh, which we which were around 250,000 and what we always try to do is put those market expectations in context. Uh, so this job number was better than expected. That's what how we see it to answer your question. It was better than expected. Uh, we have officially gained back. When you talk about gaining back all the jobs uh, that were lost during the pandemic, and we did it faster than the past downturns, that's a good thing. That's a good thing for our economy. That's a good thing for, uh, for Americans. And so that is what we're going to continue to do. We want to make sure millions of families have the dignity and the peace. You hear the president talk about that. He said this uh, today, the peace of mind that a paycheck provides, and that is good news. We saw this as good news for, uh, not for us, but for the American people. I'm going to go to the back. Oh my goodness! I'm going to go to Ed, and then I'll come. I'll come around. Go ahead. Ed. Yeah, the, the, on the Super Bowl. Uh, yeah, on the about, Super Bowl. On the Super Bowl. Um, so the president talked about creating <laughs> 613,000 manufacturing jobs since February of 2020, but only 41,000 of those have actually been created. The rest have been added back. So is that misleading the American public? Uh, no, we we don't think so. I mean, if you, I just talked about this. If you think about when we talk about U.S. manufacturing is back, it, it's still the fastest recovery uh, that we have seen since 1950. Uh, that matters. But it's not creating those jobs; it's adding back the vast majority and creating 41,000. But we're talking about recovery, right? The fastest recovery. Uh, and that matters. And so that's why the CHIPS and Science Act is so important, because one of the things, when you think about manufacturing jobs, uh, you think about Made in America, when you think about investing manufacturing here, that is what we're trying to do, and that's what the CHIPS uh, now law is going to do as well, making sure that we are investing here, making sure that we're, when we talk about the CHIPS, uh, when we talk about semiconductors, uh, making sure that that is ha being done here, created here, and being kept here. Uh, that is, that's something that you've heard the president talk about over and over again, and now we're going to see that. When we think about strengthening the supply chain, I've been asked about national security, strengthening our national security. Uh, so all of that uh, is important to the president. We're going to see that with this act. But look, manufacturing is indeed back. We are recovering that since the 1950s, and that's what we're talking about. Now we're going to create more jobs. Yeah, and when we're on the economy, the economy created 32,000 jobs since February of 2020, as you said, has added back the rest of those jobs. Is that the significant progress for working families the president's talking about? Well, 
I, we have to step back to where we were 18 months ago, where uh, the economy, uh, there were 20 million people who were collecting unemployment benefits. That's what was happening when, we, when the president walked in. Uh, there was COVID that was killing 3,000 people, Americans, a day. Uh, schools were closed. Businesses were shutting down. This is not, we're in a different place than when the president walked in uh, to, into the White House. That matters in this story as well. The American Rescue Plan has gotten to us to a place where we're seeing a strong economy. The labor market is strong. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law is going to uh, make important critical changes uh, to our infrastructure. That's going to matter as well. We're going to continue to create more jobs. Uh, so right now, uh, you know, I was asked what we thought about the news. We think it's good news for the American people. We think we're still heading into a transition to more stable and steady growth. Uh, that's how we see things. Uh, uh, but again, you know, we're going to continue to do the work uh, on, on behalf of the American people. That's the president focus. Thanks, Karine. Um, no, that's right. You could go and then Karen. Okay. okay, go ahead. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on a question that was asked earlier about Governor Abbott's actions. Uh, you called it a stunt, but what kind of support is the administration offering cities who are receiving these migrants? There was a report the Secretary of Defense denied the mayor of D.C.'s request for support from the National Guard. So what kind of support is the administration offering? And if you're not, why not? So. We would refer you to the Department of Defense specifically, which makes the decision on the question of the National Guard as it relates to uh, uh, D.C., the mayor of D.C. Uh, FEMA is also, is FEMA's providing support, uh, including through grant funding, so we are helping in that regard. Uh, we have had constructive conversations with Mayor Bowser and her team. We'll continue to do that. We are committed to working uh, with them, as we do with all other uh, electeds as well. But we are surprised. Uh, we are indeed uh, providing support through FEMA and having those conversations uh, with leaders. And then is anyone from the administration talking to Governor Abbott or his office? Are there any kind of conversations? I, do, I don't have any uh, calls to read out to you, I, besides what else I just said at the beginning of that, the original question. Oh, Green. Oh, oh green. I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Karen. Thank I'm sorry. Uh, just one on the next couple of days and then one on monkeypox. Uh, you were very clear that the president would only travel if he tests negative, but with so much going on on Capitol Hill over the next couple of days, if the president were to test negative, would he stay in Washington over the weekend to monitor the progress on the Inflation Reduction Act? What would his engagement be like? I, I don't have anything to read out for his schedule over the weekend. As you know, the president is in the, is in the White House residence working, as he has been for the past several days. And we will continue to give regular updates from the doctor, uh, from his personal doctor, as we have been the last several days. Uh, and if any of that changes, we will be sure to, to let you all know. And on monkeypox, uh, Senator Gillibrand on Wednesday asked the president to invoke the Defense Production Act to increase the supply and access to vaccines. Is this something the president is actively considering right now? So no news on, on, on that piece. But I do want to say, by doing the public health uh, uh, emergency, that does provide some, some, um, uh, some production of the vaccine, as I just mentioned earlier. It gives, uh, it gives uh, HHS the, the tools uh, to figure out how do you get from one vaccine to, to five vaccines. That's going to be uh, really important as we're fighting uh, monkeypox and trying to end this outbreak. And so uh, a couple of things that I just wanted to, uh, specifically what the FDA has identified, a potential solution that would allow us to significantly increase the number of doses available uh, to the administration. It would change the method of administration for, for Genos. Uh, under the proposed approach, a, a fifth of the current vaccine dose would be administered uh, a, a different way than it is currently without risking the overall safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. Uh, and, you know, we'll let FDA speak more to this. Uh, but this is an important, the public health uh, emergency is going to be really critical as we are trying to up the vaccine supply. Dr. Jha was on ABC today and was talking about working with manufacturers to make more doses here in the U.S. Is there anything you can share on efforts right now yeah. with the federal government to do that? So I would refer you to the FD, uh, to uh, HHS specifically. I don't have anything more to share on that, but it is an important tool that, uh, that HHS deployed yesterday when you think about the public health uh, emergency, and it will have an effect and it will make a difference as we, t as we talk about vaccine supply. Okay, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back. Okay. Courtney, I haven't, I haven't saw, called you in a while. Go ahead. I wanted to ask you 
about abortion quickly. Um, the president has talked about, um, or immediately after the fall of Roe, um, making abortion pills more accessible, um, intervening if states tried to prevent people from traveling, uh, intervening if pharmacies would give medication that was needed. Um, how are you keeping track of issues that come up in those areas so that the president can act or the Justice Department can act? How are you collecting information and being made aware of what's going on all over the country? So that, that is with the Department of Justice as we talk about travel, we talk about medication, that's with the uh, Health and Human Services. And so we leave it to them to, to to um, uh, enact what the president, the executive orders uh, that the president put forth. Uh, and clearly the president is updated pretty regularly. There's a task force that his, one of his executive orders uh, was able to create. They met a couple of days ago. They, uh, they were, uh, the president signed another executive order on the Medicare waiver. Uh, that's going to help low income uh, women get that health care, be able to pay for that health care uh, that they need. And that's also under the purview of HHS. Uh, so so they'll have all the information there. Uh, but that the Department of Justice would, would be better to answer that question, HHS, and, and of course the President is, is updated, but they hold that, that information. And has there been any, I don't want to call them hot spots or something, but issues of concern that have bubbled up, um, meaning you get a lot of complaints about one thing or a lot of issues in one area that you're hearing from Justice or from HHS? I, I don't have anything to share at this time. I would I would refer you to HHS for more specifics or any any update. I'm just going to call. I, I'm going to call a couple more. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, thank you. Uh, two questions for you on different subjects. The first, uh, last night Senator Graham uh, tweeted what he called a word of advice to Democrats who support uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. He said if you expect the CR to deliver a political payoff with 60 votes, uh, he might want to rethink. Uh, is the president at all concerned that? Uh, getting this reconciliation deal through will cause Republicans to retaliate uh, when it comes time for budgeting for 2023, for instance, by shutting down the government. What the president cares about is anti-inflation. What he cares about is lo lowering costs for the American people. What he cares about is lowering drug costs uh, for seniors, and making sure that Medicare is able to negotiate, something that he cares about very personally. Uh, he's been working on for decades. Uh, look, this is, this is the question that Republicans need to answer. This is what you should ask them. Why is it that they are uh, willing to not fight uh, or not support a bill that's going to help the American people, that's going to help the middle class? Uh, why are they willing to hold the water of corporate America? Why are they willing to push corporate welfare? It is, you know, it is something to be, we're, what we're seeing right now is really something. I mean, we are talking about a piece of legislation that 126 economists broadly, Republicans and Democrats, are supporting and saying that it's going to bring back down inflation. That five former Treasury secretaries, Republican Democrats, saying it is going to fight inflation. I mean, it is, it is just shameful to see what is happening. So if they really, really want to do the work, and we welcome them to come and do the work, they should work with Democrats in Congress and get the work done for the American people. I'm going to take one way in the back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. For me, Corinne. Go ahead. Do you? Go ahead, Andrew. Go ahead, and then we'll go to the back. Thank you. Uh, on uh, the subject that Tyler asked about yesterday, the DHS uh, IG, uh, during his campaign in 2020, the president said that he would not fire inspectors general as his predecessor had, because the job of inspectors general is to keep the government honest. How does how does an inspector general who tells his uh, staff to not uh, recover deleted text messages that could help in a congressional investigation does not notify Congress that there are missing text messages uh, as he's required to by law, et cetera? How does that keep the government honest? So we, we're looking at the facts and, and the situation. It is being investigated. Uh, so that is, you know, we just don't speak to that. We know what members of con the Congress have been saying. We understand the concerns. I hear uh, what you're saying, but there is, uh, it's being looked at at this time, and so we're just not going to comment on personnel announcement at this time. Go ahead, way in the back. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Kareem. Um, I'm wondering, since minimum wage in the U.S. has been, I think, about uh, $7.25 for decades, uh, is it possible under the Biden administration for minimum wage to change? 
I, I believe it has changed in the past 18 months. That's one thing that we have seen is like, uh, is, is the minimum wage going up and, and, and workers and companies working with their workers on that? $15 an hour, are you headed in that direction? Uh, look, what we want to make sure is that we are delivering for the American people, making sure that they have an affordable living. That is something that we are always focused on. Uh, I know that Congress is, is, is always working on uh, the uh, issues of minimum wage, uh, so I point you to them. As it comes to us, as it reach, reaches to us, look, the labor market is strong. That matters. Uh, we, uh, we are going to continue to make sure that we deal with inflation, lower the costs for American people as we've been doing. We're, our focus uh, right now is the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so uh, we're going to continue to encourage our, our, uh, our friends to support, uh, to support that bill. I'll take one last one. Crean, when it comes okay, to church sorry. vandalism, you talked to the White House sent out a statement today. Um, how they want to protect churches, other houses of worship, synagogues. Can you first comment on that and then also just the timing of that release? Why now? Uh, that is some, the president has been very clear about um, condemning uh, violence of churches, of synagogue. Uh, it is not uh, the political discourse uh, that we, uh, that, uh, you know, that we support. That should not be happening. People should be able uh, to be able to 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 go to church, uh, to be able to to uh, you know uh, be able to to do it whether in, in a Catholic church or a synagogue uh, without fear. Uh, and it is shameful that that is happening. And the president has been very clear about this, condemning uh, vandalism. And so we're going to continue to speak out against it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Green. Thank you. Thank you.